Hey, I'm Rachel Abbott, and welcome back to the Standards Tech and Science Daily podcast. If you're new here, make sure to give us a follow. Coming up, is Apple developing a foldable iPhone and iPad? But first, Cyclone Cheeto pummeled the French territory of Mayotte on Saturday the 14th of December, and at the time of this podcast being recorded, up to 1,000 people may have lost their lives, according to Mayotte's top government official, Prefect Francois Xavier Buville. The cyclone is the strongest to hit the island in 90 years and has caused major damage to public infrastructure and electricity supplies. It formed on the 9th of December, so one week ago in the southwest Indian Ocean over, over open waters. Um, it gradually made its way towards the west over the following days. It passed just to the north of, of Madagascar, um, missing the island as we went through late Saturday into the early hours of Friday. And that just led to it um, moving across or just to the, well, actually, I think it did just clip the northern part of Mayer Island uh, during Saturday itself. Um, it was very strong during during that time. The, the estimate, gusts, well, gusts recorded on Mayer Island at the airport reached 140 miles per hour. So it's, a, it's the strongest storm to impact that, that territory since at least uh, 1934. So nearly yeah, 90 years since they've had anything comparable uh, to this event. That's Nick Silkstone, expert operational meteorologist from the Met Office. The government officials said the worst devastation had been seen in the slums of metal shacks and informal structures that mark much of Mayotte. Mayotte is France's poorest island, located around 500 miles off the coast of East Africa in the Indian Ocean and has a population of just over 300,000 across the two main islands. When we live in the what we call the mid-latitude, so, you know, the, the latitude of the UK is north of the equator, our areas of low pressure are actually um, formed f- from the temperature contrast between warm air to our south and cold air to our north. In the deep tropics, there are no temperature gradients. Everywhere is warm, everywhere is humid. These cyclones are formed from warm sea surface temperatures and they're effectively like a pressure valve. They basically take heat and moisture from the ocean in the tropics and then slowly distribute it into the into what we call the mid-latitudes or, or higher latitudes. So they form as a result of yeah, f- showers and thunderstorms clustering together in an organized way in an environment where there's very light winds, you know, and other things that, that fear for them. Unlike a sort of a mid-latitude low where we live, which are steered by the jet streams and steer the jet streams themselves, these things are almost like a, a cork in a stream and are just pushed around by the, the weak ambient winds that exist in that part of the, that part of the tropics. Now, a new class of magnetism called altermagnetism has been imaged for the first time in a new study. Altermagnetism is a new form of magnetism that together with theoretical colleagues we predicted a couple of years ago. Up until that point, broadly speaking, uh, there are two types of magnetism, one of which everyone is pretty much familiar with. So ferromagnetism are kind of fridge magnets and compass and motors. The other is a more hidden form of magnetism discovered much more recently um, in the 1920s and 30s called antiferromagnetism. And this is a type of magnetism that to most people and to most intents and purposes is invisible. And that's because it doesn't have a stray field. It doesn't have any detectable means outside of it. And broadly speaking, what we would call collinear magnets, so most normal magnets fall into those two categories, or that's what we thought. Altermagnetism is a third category. And one can think of it as kind of like antiferromagnetism with a twist, uh, literally a twist. That's Professor Peter Wadley from the University of Nottingham School of Physics and Astronomy who led the research. Magnetic materials are used in the majority of long-term computer memory and the latest generation of microelectronic devices. They say the findings could lead to the development of new magnetic memory devices, with the potential to increase operation speeds of up to a thousand times. So I think the really exciting thing about the magnets is potentially they're almost like a silver bullet solution for certain types of memory. It's a, it's a really timely discovery because at the moment on uh, all of the major foundries, which are the places where computer chips are made, uh, for certain types of chips, they're now using magnetic memory on the chips. And um, this is taken a while to get to that stage, but that's the stage we're at. The ultramagnets potentially would be a much better solution than the current 
ferromagnets that are being used on chips. And these type of chips are the type that would perhaps feature in electric vehicles and um, Internet of Things type devices. Uh, so it's a very timely discovery in the sense that they provide a more scalable, faster and more energy efficient solution potentially for um, magnetic memory on chips, embedded memory. The new experimental study was carried out at the Max4 International Facility in Sweden. The facility, which looks like a giant metal donut, is an electron accelerator that produces X-rays. To make these key measurements, so the, the nice colourful pictures that are visible in the paper, um, we went to the Max4 facility. It's a bit like a smaller version of the Large Hadron Collider, except in this system you don't want to smash particles together, but you rather keep them circulating at very close to the speed of light. So you keep electrons going round this large donut shaped ring. As they corner, they emit x-rays and it's these x-rays that we want to use. So they emit extremely bright and what we would call monochromatic, so a single colour or single wavelength of light. And we make use of the ability to have this single wavelength of light in a very controlled energy and a very controlled polarization. And that's what enables us to image this magnetic order. And the there is a synchrotron in the UK, but this facility in Sweden, Max4, has a very specific geometry of the microscope we wanted to use. And it's suited very well to this, uh, this material. Next. Are Apple developing a foldable iPad and iPhone? Multiple reports say the tech giant could be planning on launching two foldable devices in the next few years. But what could come first? According to TechCrunch, the Wall Street Journal says that Apple has been developing both devices with a foldable iPhone likely to be released first. However, Bloomberg says the iPad has been the main focus. It's believed developers are working on creating a screen with no crease that's visible on current foldable phones. Let's go to a very quick break. Coming up in part two, your skin has its own immune system. See you back here in just a minute. Welcome back. Your skin can produce its own antibodies that fight off infections. That's according to two studies published in Nature. The scientists say this could pave the way for the development of needle-free vaccines that can be applied to the skin. Immune response in the skin has been seen during infection before, but Daniel Kaplan, a dermatologist and immunologist at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, said that finding similar reactions in healthy skin is a surprise and that the idea of a semi-autonomous immune system in a peripheral tissue is very exciting. Next, love them or hate them, but Brussels sprouts are expected to be larger this year, according to Tesco. But why? Apparently it's down to good growing conditions and they're expected to be up to 25% bigger. The UK supermarket chain said one of its suppliers, grower TH Clements, reported that the average sprout size this year is 30 millimetres in diameter, up from 24 millimetres last year when harvesting conditions were poor. And finally, that's the sound of a team of locals holding one of six critically endangered giant catfish, which grow up to three metres long and are among the world's rarest freshwater fish, being caught before its release in Cambodia. The catfish, caught by fishermen in South Asia's Mekong River while migrating from their floodplain habitat species, suffered an 80% decline in recent decades due to overfishing and building of dams. Four of the six fish were caught and tagged in just a single day as part of a conservation project by Wonders of the Mekong and the Cambodian Fisheries Administration. Millions of residents on the Mekong have never seen a giant catfish, which makes this discovery unprecedented. You're up to date. Come back at 4pm for the Standard Podcast. Tech and Science Daily returns tomorrow. For all the latest news, head to standard.co.uk.